Well, welcome. Today, we are going to have a very interesting event named Payment for Ecosystem Services as part of uh, Vitos Sites, our journey to Marseille. It's a series of online events leading up to the IUCN World Congress, Conservation Congress. Um, we, I, my name is Maria Fernanda, sorry. Um, I'm a communication knowledge management consultant for Bioperma, and I will be here to support you as tech host. Uh, we have a lot of participants, almost 100 participants, and more people join us right now from six continents and more than 30 countries around the world, which just show the high interest in this topic. Uh, what we are going to do today, we will start uh, with opening remarks from the OPAMA Regional Coordinator, followed by an overview of payment for ecosystem services. And then we move for uh, to hear panelists with concrete real life examples of ecosystem services around the world, some in the Eastern and Southern Africa region as well in Caribbean region. And after the panel discussion, you have time to put your questions and answers for the panelists. And we will close um, with some remarks and ask you some feedback about the event and future topics of interest. Um, this event will be recorded, but mainly the panelists are the one who have the video on, so don't worry. You can always put your questions on the chat on the question and answers uh, future from the webinar. So I'm passing now um, to Christine. Christine Menzel is the Senior Program Officer for Conservation Areas and Species Program. Um, she's the Regional Coordinator of Bioperma, the Biodiversity and Protect Area Program at IUCN. So thank you and over to you, Christine. Thanks, Fernanda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to wherever you are in the world today. Um, thank you for joining us in this uh, webinar, which I hope and I'm uh, looking forward to being a very interesting uh, discussion as well. As Fernanda says, my name is Christine Menzel. I'm the coordinator for the Bayer Palmer program for the Eastern and Southern African region. First of all, on behalf of, IU, of the IUCN Regional Office for Eastern and Southern Africa, I would like to welcome you all to this event on payment for ecosystem services as a means to increase revenue and improve management efficiency for protected and conserved areas. So this event is the third in a series of events um, on the topic of sustainable financing for protected areas. And it's also part, as Fernanda has already said, um, of the vital sites journey uh, to Marseille. Um, it's an online event that's been made possible by BioPama, Biodiversity and Protected Areas Management Program, um, which is an initiative of the Organization of African and Caribbean, African Caribbean and Pacific States, and is financed by the European Union's 11th uh, European Development Fund, EDF. BioPama is implemented by IUCN and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And the broad goal of uh, BioPama is to address the priorities of the ACP region, Africa, Caribbean, Pacific region, for improved management and governance of biodiversity and natural resources. And in this context, BioPama is pro providing a wide range of tools, services, and funding to conservation actors in, this, in these regions. Next slide, please. And just to give you a little bit more background on BioPalma, I'll keep it very short. There are essentially three main components to it. Um, four, if you look at the graphics here, but the first two are very closely linked. Um, one is the resource, the regional resource hub, which is hosted by the RCMRD, the Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development in Nairobi. And that is for the Eastern and Southern African region here. And this is essentially incorporates the regional reference information system, which was developed by the Joint Research Center. And the uh, regional resource hub, together with the reference information system, are essentially providing information and tools to support decision making for affected protected areas management. 
The second area of work um, that we focus on in Biopharma is capacity building through training and knowledge and information exchange, currently mostly online, such as this event, but also um, in the past and hopefully also in the future, we will also have uh, in-person events again around the topics of data management, but also protected areas management and uh, governance. And the last component of Biopharma is the action component, which is um, a granting mechanism, a competitive granting mechanism to uh, individual protected areas, organizations um, to improve effectiveness and uh, governance in these protected areas. So if you haven't done so already, please do visit the Biopharma website for more information or get hold of uh, me or my colleagues afterwards uh, if you're interested in uh, finding out more information. But that's just a very short overview. Next slide, please, because I would much prefer to move on now to the topic for today, uh, which you're all here for. Um, so this is this event today is based uh, in uh, also on a publication that has been uh, was commissioned by Biopharma called Closing the Gap Financing and Resourcing of Protected and Conserved Areas in Eastern and Southern Africa that is what you see on your screen now is uh, what it looks like and this report provided an overview of the current status of protected area finance in the region and explores different finance mechanisms that might be used um, to decrease the existing and in many cases also significant funding gaps. Um, it is available on the website for download if you're interested. But essentially when we launched this event, um, we looked at an overview of all the topics that, um, that were covered in this publication. And then we also requested responses from the participants of that uh, launch event as to which topics they would like to go have a deep dive session on. And so this is how we've ended up with this being um, one of the deep dive sessions. We had one about a month ago on collaborative management. Uh, that was the, uh, the first more deep dive session. And then this is now the second deep dive session uh, focused on uh, payment for ecosystem services. And in our region, well, globally, uh, payment for ecosystem services models uh, there are increasing models across the world. It's been a topic that's been uh, on our tables for quite some time, but even in our region, we have quite a number of uh, examples of um, models that are working and that are currently um, in progress. And what we've tried to do here is pull some of those together as examples. And then also we have a guest from Costa Rica with us today, um, to also speak about the sort of more national approach that uh, Costa Rica has taken in this regard. Um, then one more little admin issue. So to help us now with subsequent events, we will be doing at the end, we will have a small survey again. I just mentioned how we prioritize what we offer. And so if you can please take the time to help us with prioritizing what is of interest to you, we would ask you to please um, complete that online survey at the end um, so that we can then plan the next one uh, in accordance with the interests out there. Um, yeah, so now uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague Kathleen Fitzgerald. Kathleen is a partner at Conservation Capital, where she's focusing on increasing revenue for protected area management and wildlife conservation, and also serves as a senior advisor to the African Wildlife Foundation. So Kathleen will give us an initial overview of payment for ecosystem services, and then she will also introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you, and over to you, Kathleen. Great. Thanks, Christine, and welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, it's great to be here with everyone and welcome. Roxana, can you move to the next slide? So what I would like to do in my short introduction is provide a brief overview of payment for ecosystem services. We have people from NGOs, donor institutions, as well as protected area agencies. So we just wanna make sure everyone is on the same level before we get into the specific case studies. So on the slide here, you see Africa and the protected areas. And I think the reason why we have over 125 people on this webinar today is the recognition 
that there is a massive funding gap in Africa and there's a massive funding gap globally. And on the slide here, you see two studies. The first one was done in 2018, Peter Lindsay, myself and colleagues looking at how much do we need to manage protected areas in Africa? And we used Lion as a proxy. And what we found was we needed more than 1 billion annually. Just recently, the Paulson Institute looked globally at protected areas. And what they found was the biodiversity financing gap is approximately $700 billion per year. So the bottom line is we all know there's a gap and the bottom line is what COVID has shown us is that relying on one form of revenue is not sustainable. And so payment for ecosystem services is another mechanism that can be used to generate revenue for conservation. And it can also be used to diversify revenue streams. And that's why we're here today. Next slide, please. So the first question is, what is a payment for ecosystem service? And we do a chapter on this in the Closing the Gap report. Um, and the link has been shared if you haven't seen this report. But essentially, a payment for ecosystem service is when a beneficiary or a user of an ecosystem service makes a direct or indirect payment to the provider of that service. And the next question is then, well, well what is a service? What kind of service? Um, in the protected, sorry, in the payment for ecosystem service literature, there are four services that are outlined. One is a provisioning service, which is essentially products obtained from ecosystems such as food and water. And we'll be hearing about water in the case studies today. The second one is a regulating service, which are essentially benefits obtained from the regulation of ecosystem processes such as air quality and pollination. The third are cultural services, which are non-material benefits that people obtain, such as spiritual enrichment, recreation, aesthetic experiences that directly impact people. And we'll be hearing some examples of that today. And lastly are the supporting services that are needed to maintain these other services, such as photosynthesis and nutrient recycling. So the bottom line is these ecosystem services are valuable for our economies, for our lives, and yet historically they have not been valued and they haven't been paid for. And so what payment for ecosystem services try to do is essentially value those services and set up a model whereby the users pay for those services. Next slide. So we're going to be hearing today about some PES arrangements that have been set up. And in the report, we outline some of the steps required to set up a payment for ecosystem service arrangement. And this is obviously oversimplifying a very complicated process, but the six steps that we outline in the report include one, identifying the ecosystem service and the boundaries of that service. Two is identifying who are the owners of that service and who are the buyers of that product. Three is figuring out where the market is and what is the price. So how do you evaluate these ecosystem services? How do you put a price tag on them? Four is determining the governance and the institutional structure for these arrangements between the providers and the buyers. Five is establishing a baseline because obviously once these arrangements are established, you need to monitor the ecosystem services and ensure that the payment is actually protecting that service. And last is the legal structuring, financing and implementation. Next slide, please. So this is an oversimplification of PES. And perhaps you've seen this diagram before, um, but here you have a classic example where you have upstream 
community stewards and providers of watershed services. And so by maintaining forests, by maintaining soil stabilizing trees, the communities that live in those upstream areas on this diagram essentially protect the water which then flows downstream. And the downstream users are benefiting from that. And the downstream users are the buyers or they should be the buyers of that service. And so your classic PES example is when those downstream users pay the upstream users for that service. So there's your, your PES 101 diagram. Next slide, please. In the report, we looked at global trends in PES. And what we found was um, the value of global annual transactions of PES is approximately 36 to 42 billion, which is quite significant. We also found that the majority of the PES arrangements were focused around watershed protection. And in the report, we highlight one example, the sloping land co conversion program, which is in China. And that's the image on your screen here, where China paid 32 million farmers and 120 million households to convert steep croplands to forest. And so one of the things that we'll be thinking about today when you hear the panelists is about scale. And what China has done is at scale. And I think the question many of you wrestle with is, how do you take these PES initiatives and scale it? And we'll be hearing more about that today. Next slide, please. In the report, we also looked at specifically East and Southern Africa. And what we found was in East and Southern Africa, a majority of the PES arrangements are contingent on donor funding and or NGOs, which means it's not necessarily sustainable. And the reason for that is many of these arrangements lack a commercial angle, which really place a value and a demand on those natural resources. Lastly, what we found was where there are commercial agreements, where there are sustainable PES programs in East and Southern Africa is in red, carbon. And we'll be hearing about that today. And those of you who have participated in prior webinars um, may remember Jamie Hendrickson from Wildlife Works who presented on red in Kenya. Today, we'll be hearing about red in Tanzania and in Uganda. Next slide, please. So there's your PES 101. And I hope that at least establishes a baseline of what is a PES, what are the services, what are the steps? We've brought together a panel today of individual experts who have really amazing practical experience with PES and I'm delighted and you're gonna hear their stories. You're gonna hear what they've been doing in their respective countries. Um, their bios are on the IUCN and Eventbrite page. So I, I'd be here all day if I went through their bios because they're so accomplished. Let me introduce each of them briefly. Louise Stafford is with the Nature Conservancy and she's the Source Water Protection Director for the Nature Conservancy and she's based in Cape Town. Um, and she joined the Nature Conservancy in 2017. Um, prior to working with the Nature Conservancy, she worked in South Africa with the Working for Water program an incredible program in South Africa, internationally acclaimed, focused on restoring ecosystems, removing exotic and invasive species. Louise also worked with Cape Nature and the city of Cape Town on invasive species. And Louise is gonna bring a really interesting case study that the Nature Conservancy has developed in Cape Town, which focuses on ecological infrastructure and how you build a case, a business case for using ecological infrastructure to restore water flows and ecological integrity. So delighted to have Louise here with us. Next is Joe Anderson, who's the founder and director of Carbon Tanzania. 
And Joe's background is in ecology, environmental assessment. Um, he's a, he was a tour guide in Tanzania and he has some experience in journalism. But Joe co-founded Carbon Tanzania in 2007 in direct response to a need to address deforestation in a sustainable manner. And what Carbon Tanzania has done is really empowered local community members to manage their natural resources and linking them to carbon markets. And so we'll be hearing more about Carbon Tanzania from Joe. Next from Uganda, delighted to have Pauline Kalundu here. She is the executive director of EcoTrust, um, which is a conservation organization in Uganda. Um, and Pauline is an expert in establishing and managing innovative conservation finance mechanisms. She's really pioneered carbon programs in Uganda and really helped equip small farmers with the skills and the techniques they need to link to carbon markets. Um, she launched a, a program called Trees for Global Benefit, which received an award, for example, in 2013 for innovation and sustainability. And so really looking forward to have Pauline here with us and to hear her story. Last and certainly not least, delighted to have Manuel Guerra here with us from Costa Rica. And Manuel is a water resource specialist with Fundacor. Now, all of us in Africa have heard a lot about Costa Rica. Going back 30 years ago, Costa Rica started paying small farmers to restore land to forest and to ensure water flows. It's a model that's been used around the world for PES. And so we're delighted to have Manuel here to talk about the amazing work that Fundacor is doing in Costa Rica. Um, Manuel's background is in environmental management, tropical biology. Um, he's the technical manager of a program called Aqua Tica, which we will hear more about, which is really focusing on water for future. How do you restore forests to secure water flows and water quality? So delighted to have Manuel here very early in the morning in Costa Rica. Thank you so much. So let's start this panel. And just a reminder for those of you listening, and we now have over 140 people, um, please type your questions into the chat. If you have a specific question for a panelist, feel free to highlight that. Um, if it's for all the panelists, fantastic. Um, we have a few questions for the panelists and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. So for starters, I'd like to start with Louise, please. And all the panelists will have four minutes. If you can just please tell us about the program that you are managing running how it works, and please be specific because um, the audience here really wants to understand how have you made PES work financially? How have you made it sustainable? Um, and so Louise, we'll start with you if you can talk about your program. Thank you. Thank you, um, and uh, Kathleen, and uh, good day to everybody. Uh, we can move to the first slide. Thank you. So I'm going to use a water fund model just to demonstrate how one can uh, close the gap for payment for ecosystem services and specifically talk about the Greater Cape Town Water Fund. Next slide, please. Two thirds of the watersheds upon which the Greater Cape Town Water Fund, water, uh, the Greater Cape Town region, previous slide, please upon which the Greater Cape Town region depends are invaded by alien plants. And most of these areas are on protected areas. The region loses 55 million cubic meters of water every year as a result of the alien plant infestation. And that equals to two months water supply for Cape Town. And if nothing is done, the water losses will double within 20 years. Next slide, please. So in 2018, we launched a business case uh, that's based on science 
and we identified seven sub water catchments in the uh, water supply system for the region where we should focus um, to get the highest return on investment and turn the water losses into gains. And the business case has shown the, uh, the um, investment in nature-based solutions is the most cost-effective and sustainable solution. Okay, next slide. So this slide shows the implementation lifespan of the Greater Cape Town Water Fund. It's 30 years. The blue bars show the first six years, which is the high impact phase, where we turn the water losses into gains. And the orange bars show the maintenance phase for the next 24 years. And the dotted line show the accumulation of water gains. And you can see the cost is less. Uh, is, uh, but not in the first uh, high impact phase. Next slide. So how do we get do the funding? Uh, we work with the, with government, the national government, the local and provincial government. We work with uh, the private sector and currently this is the, the, the we're using a blending fund, funding model. And for the lifespan of 30 years, we need $25 million uh, and we have a shortfall of $13 million. So we have a strategy in place to look at how are we going to address that shortfall. Next slide, please. And that strategy is based on the following principles. First of all, we started with implementation. It's essential that we implement effectively, that we build a credible record. Then look at long-term funding solutions. We have a, a take that long-term 30-year view, leverage and advocate for public funding processes. And as C Kathleen mentioned, you, we cannot rely on the private sector alone. We've got to look at pro public se sector for that long-term sustainability. And then continue to look at the philanthropy and the corporate replenishment, but we don't foresee this to be more than 20% of the annual funding. And then to, to cover the management cost, we need an endowment for the long-term sustainability. So this is the strategy. There's my details and thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Louise. Um, really good example to start off with. And I'm sure many of you saw in the newspaper um, that Cape Town had run out of water. So excellent example, Louise, of the Nature Conservancy doing a public-private partnership, a PPP, for restoring the watershed and in the long term saving money in doing so. I suspect we're going to have a lot of questions about how that was actually set up and how you started that, um, but also another great example of scale. Really impressive, so thank you, Louise. Um, Joe, over to you to talk about Carbon Tanzania and, and what is the model that Carbon Tanzania is using in Tanzania? Thank you very much, uh, Kathleen, um, and thank you, uh, Christine, for that. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about Carbon Tanzania's um, Yida Valley RED project. Um, RED uh, stands for reducing emissions through, from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, and our project is an avoided deforestation project in northern Tanzania. It uh, compensates local forest resource owners uh, for their activities, uh, such as uh, bylaw enforcement, um, governance decisions, uh, revenue disbursement, and such. Um, and these activities lead towards uh, a reduction in deforestation rates in areas that they have set aside for protection uh, under uh, legally binding uh, land use plans. Uh, the basis for this PES arrangement, um, and just to, to make the point, uh, red uh, uh, and in this case, uh, paying for um, uh, people to avoid deforestation is of course, essentially a, a giant payment for ecosystem services scheme. Um, the basis for our particular arrangement in the Yida Valley is a legal contract between Carbon Tanzania and three village communities uh, in the Yida Valley. Um, it's based on these individual 
village land use plans, as I mentioned, um, which, and those land use plans themselves, it's important to understand, were designed and uh, put in place by the communities themselves. Uh, these resource owners are responsible for protecting this resource under the contract and ensuring that there are equitable benefit sharing um, of, uh, of the revenues um, amongst their community members. Uh, essentially, this is the service they're providing. Uh, Common Tanzania, as the other counterparty to the contract, is responsible for implementing a monitoring, reporting and verification system that leads to certification of these activities against an international standard, in this case, the Plan Vivo standard, um, for, to produce these verified emission reductions, the unit of carbon. Uh, it's, it's interesting to point out, Plan Vivo themselves actually frame uh, this, this arrangement for creating carbon assets as a PES scheme. Um, they're very clear about that. Uh, as with any relationship, of course, um, oh, well, I should also point out, under this contract, the communities receive about 60% of the gross revenues um, realised from the sale of these carbon reductions. And uh, of course, this share that they receive must pay for the activities that are defined under the contract. Um, and also, we must be sure that these um, payments are delivering measurable socioeconomic benefits for the communities. Uh, this is to help uh, or to ensure that we establish and maintain political buy-in from these communities. Um, and we'll talk, I'm sure we'll get much more questions about the details, but just to point out that the arrangement, this contractual arrangement, um, although there's a clear revenue share um, and there's clear responsibilities, like any business relationship or any relationship, um, each party benefits from, from collaboration and cooperation with the other. Um, from Carbon Tanzania's point of view, we benefit from the traditional knowledge of those communities in their forests, in managing their forest resources, which contributes to the success of the project. And on the other side, the communities benefit from some of our advice and hopefully technical input to help them deliver on their obligations. So that's a, a quick uh, sort of summary of how we have set up the contract and the PES scheme. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Joe. That's fantastic. Um, so communally owned land, community doing land use plans, and then as part of that, Carbon Tanzania providing the technical support to enable the community to then link to a carbon market, which essentially enables them to uh, manage their land within their own land use plans and receiving benefits. Fantastic. So Pauline, over to you from Uganda, also a, a, red, um, a red case study, but a bit different. So we'll hear from you now, Pauline. Thank you. Um, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first slide, please. Um, this uh, initiative is called Trees for Global Benefit, and it's a cooperative scheme whereby uh, different uh, thousands of smallholders uh, put together are mobilized by end of last year, we were very close to 9,000. Right now we are in the region of 10,000 uh, different smallholders. It brings together small different smallholders within the concept of uh, landscape restoration as a business, where the community makes a community vision and then uh, Every smallholder is um, treated as an economic unit that is facilitated to develop a land use plan and a business, which also doubles as a business plan. So using the Plan Vivo standard that uh, Joe has uh, already elaborated, uh, we, we quantify the environmental services that are likely to be generated by those land use plans and we commoditize them. Then we use the certificates to sell them ex ante and mobilize uh, what we call foreign direct investment in smallholder led uh, initiatives. So by the end of last year, we had mobilized uh, 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 about uh, 9 million uh, US dollars in this initiative. And as Joe mentioned, under the Plan Vivo standard, 60% of, of the income goes to the community. 
And so far, we have already delivered about uh, 3 million US dollars uh, to the community. Uh, next slide. This is basically an initiative that is you, uh, based on local-based solutions, where uh, local farming communities and local technicians that live within the communities work with national experts to identify local problems and uh, tailor solutions that are suitable to the socioeconomic and uh, cultural setting. We work with communities that are around uh, protected areas, currently in the Albertine Rift and Mount Elgon. So what we do is that we aggregate actors and actions. Every new, we have an aggregated, an aggregation platform which works as a program of activities where every community or every action is introduced into the program through a technical specification that specifies the type of, of activities they will, they will use the land for and also the, the environmental services that will accrue mm -hmm. from that, uh, from that uh, uh, land use. And um, we structure the performance-based payments to transform the smallholder investment horizons from short-term to long-term horizons that are uh, suitable for a landscape restoration uh, program. And the main incentive here is through the way we structure this, these payments is, is, is is, is made to create multiple income opportunities for these smallholders so that they invest in landscape restoration because it makes business sense. And this, this predictability of financing over a very long period that is linked to, to performance is, is really what transforms these, these, uh, these landscapes. But also the payments are made through uh, village savings and loans associations and the smallholders can use their agreements as collateral for loans. And then they also get income from the products of the, of the land use uh, uh, practices. And then because the, the land use plans and community visions achieve uh, so many benefits, uh, SDGs, agriculture, tourism, we are also able to access financing from many uh, bilateral and multilateral donors that together put together uh, the financing that enable the participation of local communities in, in the conservation of uh, protected areas. Some of the land is owned by farmers, but some of the land they just have use rights within protected areas. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Pauline. And a really nice segue um, from Joe, who, again, as you pointed out, Plan Vivo as the verifying mechanism. Um, and the other thing that, that you've introduced, Pauline, is this blending of commercial and donor funding. Um, and I think we'll hear some more examples about that. So thanks, Pauline. The other key thing that you've introduced is a payment for performance mechanism both short-term and long-term. Um, we're getting tons of great questions to all of you from the audience, so thank you. Um, Manuel, over to you. Tell us about what's happening in Costa Rica and, and the work that you're doing with Fundacor and how it is that Costa Rica has, has just led the way with payment for ecosystem services. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you in this webinar and share a little bit about uh, what we have been doing in Costa Rica and in Fundecor. So, uh, please, Roxanne, the next slide, please. Um, okay, uh, this one. Okay, um, since 1940, uh, we have been mapping uh, our forest coverage, and this is a very used uh, slide. Um, that show us how Costa Rica has lost uh, the forest coverage uh, in a few years. Uh, as you could, could see, uh, there's um, in 1940, we used to have like 75% of the forest coverage. By 1977, uh, we have lost more than half of the forest coverage. In 1983, we reached 26 percent of the forest coverage. So um, we have lost most of the, the forest coverage, and those 26% belongs to uh, national protected areas. 
Uh, but that point, uh, between 1961 and 1983, not just the government, but the environment, uh, environmentalistic uh, people, and also the productive uh, sector of Costa Rica realized that we, has, uh, we have a problem. So uh, what they have to uh, start doing is to think about uh, some of the uh, solutions that we reached in 1997 with the forestal law, the 75-75. By 1992-1995, we start a pilot of the PES in, a, in the Atlantic area, leading by Fundecor. This was the first uh, time that we recognize a payment for environmental services in a private land, okay? And with that uh, was the base to the government to establish the payment for environmental services in the forestal law, okay? Uh, also, by the uh, year 2000, the Empresa de Servicios Públicos de Heredia, which is like a, a water service uh, uh, um, enterprise, uh, uh, established the uh, environmental water fee uh, to sustain uh, the forest that provides them the water. Uh, but, uh, but that time, uh, we had already established the FONAFIFO, which is the uh, Fondo de Financiamiento uh, Forestal. Uh, and that uh, FONAFIFO was um, financing by uh, external um, incomes and also a uh, fuel tax, okay? That was established by the law too. So with that tax, uh, we support all the PES in Costa Rica and uh, that provide us uh, the trust fund to uh, keep doing this over the years, okay? Uh, maybe you can, uh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, what are the uh, environmental services that we recognize by the law? Uh, are those for the greenhouse uh, mitigation, the biodiversity, water protection, and scenic view. Uh, what is the amount of money what uh, we pay for those services uh, by FONAFIFO is $64 per year uh, in a um, contract of five years. So uh, what we do is that uh, the landowner sign a contract with FONAFIFO and FONAFIFO pays them those $64 per year per hectare for five years, okay? Uh, this is the regular scheme, uh, but also uh, for every 10 uh, appliance for FONAFIFO, just three of them receive the uh, payment for environmental services. So there are seven, seven of them that they are keeping in line, okay? Uh, that, is a, that is a statement that uh, shows that this scheme is very, very uh, robust and the people likes it, no? But uh, also we have to start looking forward for another schemes that allow those other seven people or seven landowners to get into something like that, okay? Because they know that uh, forest protection is a benefit, not just for the environment, but the society also. So next slide. So here is two examples of, uh, uh, of different schemes uh, involving another initiatives or another types of recognizing uh, payment for environmental services. The first one is with FONAFIFO and um, also is with uh, hydroelectric uh, power stations, could be private uh, hydroelectric power stations that they need water to produce electricity. Most of our um, electricity is produced by clean uh, energy, like other like uh, hydroelectric power. So what they do is they give money to FONAFIFO and then from the core provide uh, technical assistance to the landowners. The landowners receive that money and the landowners provide those ecosystem services like base flow, like uh, water protection, 
and that they give them the tools to the hydroelectric power stations to produce electricity. The another one is, as um, Luis was saying, over here in Costa Rica, we also have a water fund that is called Aguatica. Okay, this is a, a, another scheme uh, that will complement what Fonafif is doing, no? Uh, Fundecor is the technical secretary of this water fund, and this is a private and a public uh, and society water fund, and uh, Aguatica will provide uh, funds through the stakeholders to Fundecor. Fundecor would uh, invest in, la in private landowners, these landowners will provide these ecosystem services like more water, uh, less runoff, less sediments, and those ecosystem services will be replenished into the nature. And this will be a tool to uh, those stakeholders to uh, uh, acquire the could be the uh, water neutrality on so, on some other certifications. So those schemes are very, very useful to complement what Fona people has been doing over the years. Great, thanks Manuel, fantastic. Um, you know, really what an incredible restoration story from a 75% forest coverage to 21% and now back to 52% and some innovative ways to pay for it. Um, such as the fuel tax, which you mentioned. And a lot of the questions coming in from the chat is, well, how do you pay for this? Who's going to pay? Is there a carbon market? Um, so great examples. Louise, I'm going to uh, go back to you and um, each of the panelists. Can you just talk about um, if you're advising the participants here today, governments, donors, other practitioners um, on setting up a payment for ecosystem service. What, what are the key enabling factors that you have found in setting up your projects? I mean, Manuel just talked about Costa Rica where it's essentially been government led. Um, can each of you just comment on key enabling factors for your projects, which have allowed you to succeed in setting up these programs? Thank you um, for the question, Kathleen. The first, the, the, the stakeholders, whose land, the landowners are important. Um, without land ownership uh, involvement, it will be very difficult to set up a, a payment for ecosystem services model. Secondly, is uh, the users to understand who, the, who, the, who depends on the ecosystem services. So it's firstly whose land it is, secondly, who depends on it. And then to bring those two together, it's essential for the land or for the users to understand the value of that ecosystem service. And that is why a business case is important because it helps you to quantify the benefits, it quantifies the problem, it costs the problem, and then it helps um, to, to quantify the, 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 the return on investment. And then to start somewhere, because this is such a, it's about scaling, but unless you have a demonstration project where you can trial and error, uh, through trial and error, attract uh, attention, from from uh, potential uh, uh, contributors or donors. And then once you have uh, shown what can be done, then to scale it. Um, don't try and scale the pipe, eat, eat a, a bite of too much uh, because it becomes very difficult. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's what I can, can uh, offer. Thanks. That's great. That's good advice. And you just answered one of the, well, one of the questions that keeps coming up, for example, Craig Beach from South Africa just asked about rights around these natural resources. And so, as you said, Louise, one of the challenges is really identifying ownership of the rights and great recommendation in terms of start small and then scale it up. Don't try to go big first. Um, so very practical advice. Joe, what about Carbon Tanzania in terms of challenges and enabling factors? 
Thanks, Kathleen. Um, so I think the, the first thing that I would focus on is that in, certainly in the case of community owned uh, resources, which is where we're certainly focused at the moment, the, the key thing is understanding, of course, the opportunity cost that is involved in dealing with the, the, the issue at hand, which is obviously deforestation. Um, and largely, I would say, just for those people out there, in Tanzania, the, the, the really the, the most key uh, driver of that is shifting agriculture. Uh, we do have areas where charcoal extraction is an issue. There is some timber extraction, but just to make the point, the vast majority, more than 70% of deforestation in Tanzania is driven by shifting agriculture, which is a contrast, I know, to some other parts of the world, some, certainly different parts of Africa. Um, so we're trying to understand what is the cost to the community of dealing with this issue. And if you can, if you can get a good idea of that, then of course you have a very good basis for designing your PES scheme. That's really what we're talking about. Um, you know, it, it, understanding that those, those um, that, that opportunity cost requires, uh, I mean, you can do your research, just look at the village budgets, look at how much uh, economic activity is obviously going on in your, in, in those communities. Um, but, but also it's about investing time, of course, in people, um, investing time, uh, getting to understand um, the communities, uh, the cultural groups that are, uh, that you're hoping to work with, and um, and that will obviously reveal a lot of this this basic uh, data that's needed to understand what sort of um, benefits need to be realised by those communities, both uh, fiscal and non-fiscal, um, for them to to act in in the way that the PES scheme is 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 expecting, of course. Um, so, you know, to, to understand and appreciate the, the, the kinds of spending that will be needed uh, in that context to meet the socioeconomic needs of, of the population. And then the second bit, totally related to that, of course, is that once you, once you have an idea of uh, what you think uh, the socioeconomic benefits are, what, once the money is flowing and people are the community is receiving money, um, what you need to know is that those, the, the, the experience of those socioeconomic benefits is being linked by the community members to the activities that are generating the PES, that's generating the, the service. Um, again, in this case, preventing deforestation. And you know, that connection between the ecosystem services being pr provided and you know, the, the, the associated payments is, is a very, very hard thing to demonstrate. It is no simple thing. I mean, it's a holy grail of conservation probably across the world is how do we prove that the, the conservation of a resource is genuinely leading to a, a better outcome for the people who are bearing the cost of conserving that resource, even if it's a national government or just a small village. Um, and, you know, while we at Carbon Tanzania can say that a, a very clear proxy for us is the regular um, renewal of the right to sell a carbon asset, which essentially is a, a verification against this standard we talked about, the Plan Vivo standard. If, if each year the, the, the issuing standard recognizes those efforts by issuing the carbon assets, the, the verified emission reductions, in a way that recognizes that the system is working. But it's still hard to really see that, you know, at a granular level. Um, I mean, I can only offer a good example, because at the macro level, that might be enough. At the micro level, we want to know that not just the people who are being paid to patrol the forest or the people who are distributing money and having meetings. We want to know that people who are often not involved in the PES are feeling benefits somehow. Um, and I can give a quick example. I mean, we, we, we have uh, sort of a couple of times a year, a mobile clinic, a health clinic goes around this quite remote area that we work in. And they do eye uh, clinics and TB testing and that sort of thing, basic things for very prominent things that affect those populations. Um, and we, you know, we, we've had a few direct feedbacks, very anecdotal, 
but perhaps important. Um, a couple of old ladies who've had bad eyes, trachoma, um, sort of classic problems for pastoral, rural pastoralist people. And she said, you know, I've had my eyes treated because of the forest. And, you know, that sort of direct link in someone's head is, is, is the absolute sort of kernel of a successful long-term uh, PES from our point of view. So those two things probably are, are key, both, you know, both to answer the question of what the, what the challenges are, and probably, you know, you can think of those at the bigger scale uh, to answer your question briefly about what a government or, or you know, jurisdictions would need to think about if, if PES is going to be legislated for or if policies are going to be put in place to promote some sort of PES schemes at, at any scale. Uh, they're, they're two very important pillars, I would say. Anyway, I'll stop right. there. You'll speak. No, that's really helpful, Joe, because what you've introduced um, is it's not just about, uh, you know, Louise mentioned determining who owns the asset and then structuring the transaction. And let's say you find a buyer and there are some questions about buyers, which I'll ask later to you and, and Pauline and others. But then once the money comes in, ensuring that is used to actually manage and protect the asset. And so that gets into a whole governance question. And, you know, Pauline, you have a ton of experience on this, given you're working with hundreds of small farmers. Um, what's your advice, Pauline, to all the participants here in setting up a successful PES project? Oh, you're on mute, Pauline. Uh, thank you very much. A small correction. We are working with tens of thousands, not hundreds of smallholders scattered all over the country in about five different landscapes. Uh, for, for us, one of the lessons we've learned is that um, it's, it's not so much about a specific policy on PES, but it's an enabling environment. You know, when he talk, she talked about the land ownership, but also the land use. So whatever interventions are coming into the area, it's a lot easier if they are already compatible rather than competing, for example, with agriculture or, or, or the other economic needs of the area. And then uh, to, to have a PS scheme, there is so much that is involved, even being able to deliver the payments to the farmers. We are working with remote communities that are excluded from many of these uh, services. They are uh, not included in, in financial services, uh, digital inclusion, and so many of those other things. So you find there is so much that you need to do to have in place to be able to, to have it work. But also the other thing that we have learned is that uh, the smallholders actually have solutions to environmental conservation. The reason they take short-term investment horizons is because they've been put in some poverty corner that they can only think about a, a seasonal planning because they need money for tomorrow, they need school fees and all those things. So they can only plan in those horizons, not because that is how they want to live, but because that is how uh, the world has pushed them in a corner. So when you sit down with them they, and create a vision, they actually have amazing solutions that can be applied. And we, what we have also learned is that the, the because we are far removed from the market, the market doesn't understand the smallholder farmers and they have this perception that they, they are a, a risky lot. But, they, but the, through the, you don't have to, to force them so much to, to, to take the Eurocentric way of, of addressing risk or the market way of, of addressing risk. You can actually take the smallholder strategies, the, small, the smallholder initiatives, and design them in a language that the market understands. And, and that's how we've been able to be in the market for at least 15 years. And we are now at the level where we are able to generate uh, between 
uh, 100 and 200,000 uh, certificates via us um, uh, every year. So I think that it's very important to take a learning by doing approach where you realize that the smallholders themselves or the landowners themselves have the solutions, but what, what they need to do is to be shown that these solutions of theirs can actually be done as a business. And then, so what we do is that we just use a structure that will deliver many um, income generating opportunities at different levels of, of, the, of this new investment. And what we have also learned is that in this blended business model, there is a type of funding that is suitable at a certain level of growth. So what we do, we use public sector financing to, de to de risk the investments so that that de-risking can tell a story that can attract a more risk-averse private sector to partner with the smallholders. Thank you. That's great, Pauline. And you've just introduced a whole new and really important element on risk. And, and you've articulated it so well in terms of what EcoTrust has done to de-risk the product. And so that was tremendous. Thank you for that. Manuel, from Costa Rica, if you're advising participants, and a lot of people are asking, you know, what are the key enabling factors to make PES work? And we just heard from Pauline, it's not necessarily the policy environment. Um, she's urging, you know, learn by doing, as yes. long as the policy doesn't prevent you from doing that. What about from Costa Rica, your experience? I think uh, for Costa Rica, uh, the, the, the thing that make PES uh, be sustainable and work uh, was the, the first step of realizing that we having a problem at that time, losing the, that forest coverage and realizing that that forest is not just timber also provides another type of services, not just wells. Um, when we find out that and the government was convinced that we are losing or we were losing that um, biodiversity, that forest coverage, um, that opened a whole new world to us. And when the government is aligned to that, it's more easy uh, work for that goal, no? Uh, establishing the law, that forestal law that uh, established those uh, uh, ecosystem services and the recognition of those ecosystem services uh, allowed us uh, to um, explore new initiatives and new uh, ways or, or structures to, uh, to grow this fauna uh, fifo and these uh, other uh, um, projects or uh, initiatives, no, like Aguatica or uh, La Empresa Servicios Públicos de Heredia with the environmental fee. Um, also, um, the forestal law um, established that uh, we cannot change the land use. If you have forest, you have to keep it like forest. This is another thing that help us to uh, keep the forest, no. Uh, and what was the result of that? Uh, as you said, we reached 52% uh, and right now we are like 54% and we are trying to reach the 60% of forest coverage in our country. This is uh, something that we can show and say, okay, this is working. This PES is sustainable through the time and it's showing results. Uh, what is the main challenge of that? Okay, yes, uh, we used, uh, we were uh, able to create the law. That was uh, something that we have to work with. We have to pilot this. As you said in your presentation, we, we used to um, map all the ecosystem services that we could offer. Uh, we have to make this baseline we have to identify we are uh, who we uh, who will be the ones to be interested in these ecosystem services, and with that 
that will be very easy, no? Um, we have a major challenge right now, which is that Costa Rica is trying to reach uh, carbon neutrality by 2015. Uh, and so that uh, involves that we have to move into more clean um, energy production and some other things. Uh, we have to start um, giving up into uh, few, uh, uh, fossil fuels. Uh, we have to change our uh, cars and buses and everything. So with that, we are going to start losing that tax fuel that we're using to uh, pay for environmental services. So we have to be moving forward and start looking for another income to keep this in a structure to this recognition. So uh, that's why we are trying to look for more initiatives like Aguatica, like La Empresa Servicios Públicos de Heredia. We have a lot of uh, counties moving into uh, having this environmental fee, uh, charging the people for uh, water services and some other stuff to invest in uh, environment. So uh, those are the, the main challenges that we have right now, uh, but we are identified that and we are trying to lead with that and moving forward. Right. Manuel, someone has asked uh, a quick question for you. Yeah. The, the restoration, the forest restoration that has taken place, um, is that plantation forest or are those native forests? Are they native species? No, we have uh, two different types of. Uh, we have uh, like natural re regeneration or assisted re regeneration. That yeah. is uh, the one that you just let, let that uh, restore by themselves. Uh, that okay. will be forest, secondary forest, primary forest. And then we have another type of reforestation, which is a reforestation with a financial, financial goal, okay? So this reforestation, we establish this monoculture uh, with native species, and then we keep it for 15 years. They will receive a payment for environmental services for those 15 years for carbon fixation, and then the landowner can cut this timber, extract it, sell it, and restart with another reforestation. So this is a okay. productive cycle. So it, there are two different types of. Great, thanks for clarifying that. You're welcome. Um, Joe and, and Pauline, a number of questions from the, the audience. Um, you both mentioned 6040. Can you explain where that 6040 came from? And then everyone wants to know, is there a carbon market and who are you selling to? So you wanna start off Pauline and then go to Joe? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, the 6040 uh, is a rule by the Plan Vivo family of fraternity. The Plan Vivo standard was specifically designed to enable smallholder farmers to access the carbon market. And uh, therefore it's structured that way. But also the organizations that uh, invest in developing smallholder projects that are registered under the Plan Vivo uh, uh, standard operate on what they call a triple bottom line, where the socioeconomic, the environmental and economic um, objectives are part of their business model. So we, we struck, this is the way we can make it meaningful for smallholders to participate in this market. So it was developed through pilots and consultations. We were one of the pilot projects that contributed to, to this model. And it's, in, from my experience, it is only possible through the blended financing model. Because where the initial investments for example, are enabled through public financing. And then it's only the operations 
that, that rely on the 40%. Without that blended financing model, it's probably not possible to, to have the 60% go to the community. But having said that, even the 60% is, is limited because it only comes uh, from a certain source and for a specific reason. So the way the payments are structured to be able to, to trigger other income is where the real proper sustainability comes from, even for the, for the organization itself, for the, for the intermediary organization. It's, though that, it's that other, from my perspective, it is that other overall landscape restoration as a business that makes it work where PACE is just one of the income streams, both for the intermediary and for the implementing uh, households. Then who are our buyers? We sell in the voluntary market. We, it's, it's an aggregation. We aggregate the actors from both angles, from the supply side and from the buyer side. We work with brokers. We work with private sector companies, mainly in Europe and uh, the US. And some of them are food chains like Max Hamburger, but then that's those, those sorts of companies. They do it out of uh, uh, on, on a voluntary basis. I think I've answered the question. Great, over to you, Joe, additions to that. So additions to that, well, uh, as Pauline said, the Plan Vivo standard is clear on its expectation that 60% of gross revenue should be realized as benefits to the participating communities. So that's a simple answer. It, it, it's, it's prescribed in many ways. Um, of course, that is a nominal or notional amount, and it may or may not represent the opportunity cost that I talked about in my previous point. Uh, and in which case you would have to increase that to ensure that um, the buy-in and the political will was, was, was established and maintained, as, as mentioned. But 60-40 is the, is the guiding amount, and no less than 60 would be expected. Um, so the market. <laughs> um, there is a, 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 a very, you know, a large, uh, and surprisingly, even this year, still increasing uh, demand for, for, for for, for voluntary, for verified emission reductions, um, carbon credits, uh, on the voluntary carbon market. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it may seem strange, but um, the, the, the demand is, is only increasing as companies, um, large players, we're talking about Amazon, Google, um, Microsoft, and many other large uh, retailers around the world, uh, in, even in this last six months since the COVID crisis, have made extremely ambitious uh, commitments to become zero, uh, net zero carbon emissions for their companies uh, by 2035, 2040, 2050, whatever the target is. Um, and to do that, they can eliminate carbon emissions in their supply chains, they can eliminate carbon emissions in their operations. Um, but that doesn't happen overnight. And so the gap in the emissions that they can't eliminate uh, immediately has to be accounted for by paying for offsets. And that's where the main demand in the voluntary carbon market comes from, is from net zero uh, commitments by these large companies and many other companies. Um, so if you can generate a recognized emission reduction or carbon credit, and you can also design a marketing and communication strategy that attracts uh, particular buyers to the type of um, credit that you're producing. And when I say type of credit, uh, there is a difference between a credit that's produced through our mechanism, which is avoiding deforestation, and EcoTrust, who are restoring forests and planting trees often with smallholders, and then other types of carbon credits that are generated from natural uh, interventions in natural ecosystems, uh, large restoration of, of, of forests, natural regeneration of forests. Uh, they're, they're all different ways of, of doing the same thing, of course. Uh, but the point is that different companies will have a different demand for the type of offset that they're willing to pay for to compensate for the emissions that they're not able to account for in the period that they've committed to uh, becoming net zero. Um, so, you know, it's a matter of, for, for any uh, organization that enters into this type of PES, 
to make sure that not only are you able to answer the questions that we've talked about up until now, which is the mechanisms and the, the way that you set up the payment systems and the, those sort of things, but also that you can find the end buyer for this uh, product, essentially. Um, so again, that you know, as, as one of the contractual partners, Carmen Tanzania takes on that responsibility. And you know, from the beginning, if you're going to enter into this partnership, it, it, it really is a, a incumbent on, on, a, on, on, on the partner uh, that's contracting with these landowners, these resource owners, to take that responsibility seriously and start the process of finding buyers at the beginning of the process and not wait until everything's been put in place and the community has, has, has been convinced that they're going to put in place all these, 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 these activities which are a burden to them. And then to find out later that, well, we haven't quite got to the point of finding a buyer yet. So one of the most important things is to, to, is to align both the project development process and the, and the product marketing process very closely. So that uh, as, as the activities really bite and, the, and the, the, the protection of the forest is actually becoming real or the planting of trees in, in the case of uh, Pauline's things or um, projects or whatever else it is, once those things are real, they need to be compensated for. Otherwise, you're going to lose the faith of your of your communities and your partners. So, yeah, that's a very broad. I mean, I can talk about the details of specific contracts, but it, essentially, the, the point here is that you have to create a marketing strategy alongside your uh, investments and, and project implementation strategy, so that uh, you put in place long term. Um, financing mechanisms um, and the financing mechanism in, in, in the simplest form is selling those carbon credits. Uh, yeah. it's as simple as that. That's great. Thanks, Joe. Really practical, uh, specific advice. Um, Louise, a number of questions have come up. You described essentially it's a public private partnership. Um, so one question was about the sustainability of the project. The second question was, you know, the, the role of government in that structure and a very specific question from East Africa. Um, what is the appetite within East Africa of the governments in engaging in these types of models? Because it, it, what it might do is shift where the funding currently goes to where it may go. And so just your experience on government involvement and the appetite of governments to enter into these creative solutions that you've pioneered. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathleen. The, the, uh, the first question about the sustainability of the public-private partnerships. Um, government, real, the, the, one of the realizations is in the fact of, of the situation is that governments alone cannot solve the problem. And increased poverty and increased land degradation eventually have an impact on the ability of government to provide those essential services, such as water or to provide eco or sustainable ecosystem services, because a lot of the, the, the degradation happen on government land. So it's about communication and it's about showing government the economic and social impact of uh, catchment or watershed degradation and losing of that ecosystem service. And once government start uh, realizing that, and also many of the governments are signatories to, to, the, to, to the climate change agreements. Um, and if one can use it from that angle uh, that you're actually helping government to achieve their obligations rather than holding government accountable. So it's all about how we, we approach. Once government realized that, that there is a problem, uh, that it's very much in their um, uh, uh, responsibility to address the problems, one can, and, and they start paying attention to it, uh, one can start involving them in craft in a business case or in quantifying the losses, the cost, and then looking at the long term. In the case of, of Cape Town, it was extremely difficult to get government on board because government deals with so many conflicting, they, they've got lots of, of, of responsibilities. It's housing, it's 
it's it's uh, health and then the environment is the the one part that often gets neglected um, up until the stage where it's too late and then disasters start happening. I think COVID also provides us with an opportunity to re to elevate the the realization that if we, uh, we if we neglect uh, the environment, uh, we make it susceptible for the spread of of uh, viruses. And one can always use this example that you know we don't want to intervene when it's too late. In terms of the public private partnership, uh, the private sector is also not willing in the case of of uh, uh, turning water losses into gains through catchment or watershed restoration, the private sector is not also not willing to invest or to put money to something where it's going to, there's no sustainability. So the private sector, the users of the water, uh, big companies, bottling companies, uh, 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 food producers and companies, this, if one identify the big water users and help them understand the benefits for investing in in um, ecosystem services or in uh, um, yeah in, in water or the services that they get, they are willing to contribute. So that then brings the private and the public sector together, where the private sector can say, "We are investing in the long uh, to get you over this hump." But government, then you have to also come to the party, so to speak, and. Uh, look at the sustainability because often the upfront cost is the most expensive. So if one can bring the private sector in and then broker that government, uh, you know, building on on the initial gains. In terms of the the uh, government and their involvement, and you know, often it's government land, um, and 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 this is tricky. It's difficult or it's different in 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 different. Uh, uh, geographies, but um, if government can see the value, and if one can, they are still voters. Uh, there is still a public sector. Uh, there is still a social uh, a, a platform where one can uh, elevate this and start getting. And if you get one uh, individual, there's always a champion. You know, we find that even work. It's better to work with a willing individual in government to help change and help uh, introduce you to the different government individuals who can make a difference. Uh, and that goes also to, to the private sector. It, it's then you, it often when we try and, and solve environmental problem, it's coming from the converted. You need to take the, the, the individuals or those institutions that are not uh, naturally inclined to um, contribute or to make a to 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 restore, we need to get them on board, especially those that depend on that service. And it's also about the transaction cost. In the case of of, of water funds, water funds is bringing different sector, dif different actors together. Uh, it's communities, it's private sector, it's a pub, a government, and it creates that safe space for debate and for finding solutions, and then rely on those stakeholders to go back to the to their to their constituencies and uh, change from within. Um, and only by you know we the the cause of the environmental problems that we're experiencing is human. So we need to work with humans to to change it over time and create that willingness. Uh, but but. Without the landowners buy-in, uh, it's not. It's very difficult to get any uh, uh, payment for ecosystem services off the ground. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Thanks, Louise. That that was very clear, and it, it mirrored, um, in some respects, to what Manuel said in terms of the government of Costa Rica acknowledging the holistic value of the forest, not just the forest itself, but the role that forest plays um, in terms of ecosystem services, as well as economies, as well as livelihood. And, you know, Louise, you outlined well, um, building that business case before launching into a project 
And in many ways that mirrors something that Joe said in terms of, you know, before you take a community for a ride um, in terms of a PES program, how much does it cost? What are the opportunity costs? And then where are you going to sell these credits? Um, so really the upfront work that's needed prior to doing a PES. And as Pauline said, you know, that's where the blended finance can work, where donor funding can be used to support that due diligence, to support that planning. And then you can bring in private capital, that blending can really complement, and, and that's what EcoTrust has done so well. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. There are some very specific questions. For example, Joe, I'm sure you've seen people want to know more about Carbon Tanzania, um, how many credits, how many community members. So I'm going to urge participants visit the websites of Fundacore to learn about their program, the Nature Conservancy, EcoTrust, Carbon Tanzania, because each of the websites have very specific um, information about what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, and also visit the IUCN Biopama website, which will have the recording of this. We are also going to catalog some of these questions and we'll try to direct them to the individuals. Um, I know they just signed up for the panel, but um, Louise, Manuel, Joe, and, and Pauline, if you'd be willing to answer some questions privately, that would be wonderful. Um, and I'm gonna hand it now over to Christine from Biopama to wrap up. Great, thank you very much, uh, Kathleen. And thank you also to our um, extremely interesting um, panelists for their contributions. I really learned a lot again, um, and it was super interesting just to hear um, all these details about how exactly they are implementing um, payment for ecosystem services, what the constraints are, etc. cetera. Um, I hope very much that all of you have also uh, gained hugely from this um, event. I want to ask you, and I'm going to pause for a minute just now before closing, um, I want to ask you to please um, complete the survey to let us know what other topics are of interest to you and also about the format. So if I can ask uh, the colleagues to just post the link for the survey in the chat box, please. Um, and then I would just take a minute to ask you to please complete the survey. So it's about the format, but it's also very much about what other topic is of interest to you. I don't see the link yet. Ah, there we go. So the link has just been posted in the chat box. Um, I'm going to pause for a minute now and ask you to please uh, complete that form. If you just click on the link, it will take you directly to the survey. And in the meantime, the panelists will also potentially con uh, continue answering some of your questions in the chat box. And I see Manuel has also posted the website for Costa Rica in the chat box. So please feel free to copy that and uh, go and visit that as well. Okay, um, you may not be quite finished yet, but I would like to urge you to please uh, still complete the survey for us. Um, it really is important for us to really try and make sure we are creating interesting events uh, for you. So I would please urge you to continue and, and just uh, send off your, your quest, uh, survey to us and that will help us hugely. 
And then um, I would like to just thank all of you um, for participating in this event. And in particular, I'd like to thank all the panelists and Kathleen for a really great conversation, uh, really great presentations of um, these various different um, models that are being implemented and that are working. And I, I do hope that you will continue to engage with some of the panelists, either via their websites, uh, contacting them, um, or in uh, directly. Some have shared their emails here as well. So please do feel free to also um, engage with them directly on any further specific questions. And then lastly, I would uh, like to just thank also the European Union for the support for this important work um, through the BioPharma program, which um, we are running in the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific regions. And that's it from me. With that, um, we are almost on time, two minutes late, but that's due to the survey. Uh, thank you all very much for being here. And we will let you know about the next event um, via our email mailing list. And we will um, let all of you know that have participated today as well. You will be on that list. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.